This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Visit JabberjawMedia.com for more shows like this one. Episode number 94 of that one time on tour is brought to you by the band Hang Time. Hang Time are a seasoned melodic punk band from Toronto, Canada. Since their formation in 2009, they've continually managed to deliver hook after hook of slick vocal melodies and sugary harmonies, along with the musical aggression of many of their influences. They are currently in the studio recording their new EP, Destroy, scheduled to be released in early 2020, almost one year after their 2019 EP, Invasion. Taking cues from mid-90s punk, Hangtime's melodic, guitar-driven stylings and DIY aesthetic are on full display on their current and upcoming EP. For more information on Hangtime, you can check them out on Facebook and Instagram at Hangtime Band, as well as all streaming platforms. Now here it is, their new single, Can I Take You Out? there in podcast land what is going on as always this is chris swinney your host for that one time on tour if you're not familiar with the show this is my podcast where i get to sit down with someone in or around the entertainment industry and have a stellar conversation we're back it's episode 94 i can't believe we've done 94 of these things man last week was awesome with brad from grade and somehow hollow a lot of you guys checked it out had a lot of great feedback 
Thank you so much for checking that out. Uh, you know, this week is pretty special. The guy that I get to talk to today, it was a big one for me. I've been listening to this band since literally probably ninth grade. Today, episode 94, I got to sit down with Joe King, a.k.a. Joe Queer, from the infamous Queers. They started way back in 1981. That's when Metallica started. This band has been kicking ass for almost 40 years. That's pretty crazy, man. So, today is such a good episode. I had a great time talking to Joe, and I think you're really going to like it. Before I get to my conversation with Joe... Once again, if you listen, you know it. I got to pay some bills. I got to tell you about my sponsors, Hang Time, the band at the beginning of the episode, all the way from Canada, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You can check them out on the socials at Hang Time Band. Make sure to check out all their stuff on the streaming platform, Spotify, Apple, everything else. Check out Hang Time. They're awesome and I love them. And thank you guys so much for sponsoring today. Permanence Tattoo Gallery, all the way over in Anderson, Indiana. Actually, that's only about 20 minutes from my house, but Permanence Tattoo Gallery, downtown Anderson, Indiana, on Meridian Street. Check them out on all of the socials at Permanence Tattoo Gallery. And if you're in town, make sure to get tattooed at Permanence Tattoo Gallery. Liquid Death, they're still on as a sponsor. It's spring water in a can. It's awesome. The best water you've ever had in your life. And uh, their their motto is death to plastic because plastic is bad for the environment. So drink liquid death spring water in a can. Head on over to liquiddeath.com. And when you buy your water, put in the promo code T-O-T-O-T and you're going to get $2 off a case of water. Murder your thirst. Thanks a lot to everyone over at Liquid Death for the continued support. I really appreciate it. Back once again, Merge 4, you've heard it before, I talk about him all the time, my buddy my buddy Dewey over at Pure Pleasure Podcast, he pushes their stuff too, Merge 4, Merge 4 socks, they make socks, they make the best socks, the coolest socks around, you've got to go to Merge4.com or Merge 4 on all of the socials, check them out, and if you guys want to order some socks, hit me up, I have coupon codes, they're one time use only, 50% off your order, hit me up, and I will hit you, and I will hook you up. Hit me up and I will hook you up with a coupon code for 50% off your order. Thanks a lot to everybody at Merge 4 for helping me keep the lights on. I appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Okay, so we're getting through these sponsors. We have one more sponsor. This is the longest segment of the show because a lot of people help me keep this thing going. So we have a new sponsor. I had this guy hit me up. His name is uh, Jeff Small. He hit me up. He's a listener of the show. And he said, hey, I've got this new thing that I'm doing, and I'd like to sponsor an episode. And he told me about it, and I thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Now, it's basically, he's a math teacher. He tutors people in math. And there's a lot of people out there, believe me, that don't understand math. (laughs) I am a guitar instructor. We do a lot of counting. We do a lot of music theory, a lot of circle of fifths. And music, really, when you get down deep, I mean, you know, it's soulful and everything, but it's a big math problem. So math is near and dear to my heart, and uh, he wanted to sign on and sponsor an episode. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's called Mr. Small Does Math. Mr. Small Does Math is a free online math tutor. Quote, 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 free, 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 free. Free online math tutor with over 50 videos and more being uploaded on a weekly basis You will get the extra help you need in all facets of math. In addition, there are teacher resource videos helping teachers utilize new ideas for their classroom, most of which are provided for free and with free resources. So you can check it out. Um, He's starting to get more followers and everything, so the the URL is kind of long, so we have this tiny URL. So you can check out Mr. Small Does Math at www.tinyurl.com forward slash Mr. Okay, I'm going to start again. You can check it out at www.tinyurl.com slash Mr. Small Does Math. tinyurl.com slash Mr. Small Does Math. And he says, please just subscribe, like, and comment to the channel. 
So thanks a lot to Mr. Small Does Math for sponsoring this episode. You guys need to check that out. Math is important, and I have uh, I've seen some homework from some of my students that I teach guitar to, and man, I thought I was good in math, but they are doing weird stuff nowadays with the common core and everything. So check out tinyurl.com forward slash Mr. Small Does Math. Thank you so much for sponsoring. Math is very, very important. So if your band or company wants to become a sponsor, you can hit me up. It's TOTOTpodcast at gmail.com or on any of the social media platforms at TOTOT podcast. Make sure you're following us on all of the social media platforms. Um, if you want to help the show out on a financial level, head on over to patreon.com forward slash TOTOT podcast and get involved at one of the tiers. I'd like to give a shout out to our two Patreon producers, Bob Foster out of Hemet, California, and John Exton out of Stafford, England. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about John soon. John has a band called Between Static and Silence. They just, they're just they releasing a new single that yours truly, Mr. Christopher Swinney of That One Time in Tour podcast, had the pleasure of mastering, and we're going to be playing it on the show in the near future. So once again, shout out to our Patreon producers, Bob Foster from California and John Exton out of the UK. And that's it for trying to pay the bills. That was a long segment, but I love you guys, and I appreciate that you guys check out my sponsors because it really does help. This podcast costs money to keep going, and uh, with all of you beautiful people out there you know, taking advantage and using my sponsors and becoming patrons, it helps immensely. So that's it. Today I'm going to do a top five list, and then we're going to get into our conversation. So top five list comes in from a listener out of Australia that's actually from Venezuela, which I thought was pretty cool. So Australia via Venezuela or Venezuela via Australia. So uh, here we go. He says, hello, my name is German, which I wanted to, I wanted to really know how to say his name because uh, I don't think German is right. So I went and I, I did the whole name pronunciation thing on YouTube. And it's like Herman, I think. And he says, I am from Venezuela, but I'm living in Melbourne or Melbourne, Australia. I just want to thank you for all the countless hours of entertainment you provide. There are many other music and punk rock podcasts out there, but nothing like TOTOT. The recipe that you have is really unique. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. I, I try to keep it fresh and cool, you know? He continues, I think it's time for a part two, man. I'd suggest either Joel Green, uh, Travis from Coheed, or Mark from Taking Back Sunday, <clears throat> which he says was the first episode he was introduced to the podcast by. Man, I tell you, all three of those guys, I've talked to Joel. He was the first episode ever, Joel Green from the band Emery. He's going to be on again. He said he was <clears throat> trying to get the stuff figured out with my schedule, and his schedule is tough. Same goes for Travis from Coheed and Mark from Take It Back Sunday. They both agreed to come back. Travis from Coheed, uh, they're actually playing in Indiana in a few months, and I think uh, we're going to try to try to do one in person at the gig. So that should be happening. I know Joel will come back. And Mark, I know he listens quite a lot, and he's a good buddy of mine, so I know Mark will come back as well. I talk about this, the part twos all the time, and I think once we get to that episode 100, we'll start to kind of do some some part twos again. So uh, yeah, good idea, man. Thanks. So he says, before I give you my top five, I want to tell you that I auditioned for Judo Chop, which is the band that sponsored last week's episode about a year ago. Can't believe they're sponsoring this thing. So awesome. Yeah, Judo Chop's awesome. Go back and check them out if you didn't already. So his top five list, Herman from Venezuela via Melbourne, Australia. His top five list is top five best music channels on YouTube. He has number five, the punk rock MBA with Finn McKinty. It's an awesome music business related content. I, I watch the punk rock MBA all the time. I would have that in my top five, but I let you cover that. So I put in somebody else. But uh, yeah, I've spoken with Finn, actually, and he is going to come on TOTOT very, very soon. We're going to talk about all kinds of cool stuff, especially the Punk Rock NBA, which is a great music channel on YouTube. But he also now has the Punk Rock NBA podcast. 
So make sure that you check that out as well. It's a great companion to the YouTube channel. So number four, I've never heard of this. It's pretty cool. He has came, uh, came interviews, C-A-Y-E-M interviews. Uh, he said their live drum cam is amazing. So make sure that you guys check that out. Sounds really cool. Number three, Little Elephant. He says, awesome live performances by punk rock bands. I've never heard of that either, but I need to check that out. It sounds really cool. Number two, Caliber TV. Great live footage from, great live footage with awesome quality. So Caliber TV, I'll have to check it out. And number one, Herman has Audio Tree Live, live performance and interviews. He says he's discovered many bands, so many bands, thanks to this. Everyone should check it out. So number one, Audio Tree Live. Number two, Caliber TV. Number three, Little Elephant. Number four, Came Interviews, or Cam Interviews, maybe they just spelled it C-A-Y-E. I don't know. Number five, The Punk Rock NBA with Finn McKenty. Those are wonderful choices. Now, Herman, I'm going to give you my five, and this is off the top of my head. I just wrote these down like two minutes ago. There's probably some that I'm missing. But uh, number five, I'm going to say Bridge City Sessions. It's this really, really cool thing. I think it's up in Chicago or, or Wisconsin or somewhere. But uh, they record bands that come through on tour and they like play these sessions in their studio. It's all live. They've done the bomb pops and they've done, I think they've done like strike anywhere and cigar and, and I think maybe hot water music. There's a million bands. They've been doing it forever, but it's really cool. So check out the bridge city sessions. Um, my, my future guest, Zach Quinn from the band pairs that I just talked to today for a future episode. He has a bridge city session. I'm pretty sure his band pairs also does. So check out bridge city sessions. Really, really cool. Uh, number four, I've got 12 tone. And if none of you out there are music theory geeks, I'm pretty sure you don't know what 12 tone is, but 12 tone is this music theorist guy who goes through and kind of dissects songs and dissects different modes and just different things about music theory. And uh, he does these little illustrations with each thing that he talks about. It's really, really cool. You, I think you kind of have to be a music theory geek to like it, but check out 12 tone and see what you think. Uh, number <laughs> Number three, <clears throat> some of you guys will make fun of me for this. I don't care. Just Metallica's channel on YouTube. They have so many great live, like professional, amazing quality live things from where Metallica plays when they're on tour. They've got all kinds of historical stuff and documentary stuff and, and interview stuff on Metallica. And if you like Metallica, it's, it's one of the best channels on YouTube. There's a lot of other ones too, but it's the, you know, the official one. So yeah, of course, you know how much I love Metallica. So uh, let me see. Number two, Gear Gods. And these aren't really in an order. I just did five. So number two is Gear Gods. Um, it's really, really cool. They they review different guitar stuff and software for recording. They, you know, they do all the tune track stuff like Easy Drummer 2 and Superior Drummer 3 and Easy Mix and all these different things for software for recording and writing music. And it's it's really good to kind of learn how things work, like writing songs with fake drums or looped drums or programming drums or how to get great guitar tones. Like it's really, really cool. So check out GearGods dot not got dot com, but GearGods on YouTube. Okay, and then number one, I, I put down Kerrang. Uh it's a magazine out of the UK, but they also have a really cool music channel on YouTube. Uh they've been doing this thing lately where they get a band and they have them play in this little dive bar. And they've done like Baroness and Mastodon. And uh, they just did a Sum 41 episode a couple of months back. It's it's really, really cool. So if you want to see some cool kind of music stuff, punk bands, metal bands, hardcore bands, whatever, check out Kerrang. It's K-E-R-R-A-N-G on YouTube. So I've got Bridge City Sessions, 12 Tone, of course, Metallica, because I'm a geek, uh, Gear Gods, and Kerrang. So thank you, Herman, for your list I appreciate the support and uh, I couldn't do it without you, man. I, I, it's it's great that you guys send in all this stuff and talk to me so much. So thank you once again. I am going to stop with this intro. I'm not going to do any more segments today. I'm not going to do anything else. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen. It really helps the show out. But without further ado, I'm going to jump into my conversation with Joe King, a.k.a. Joe Queer, from the queers, it is such a good conversation, and you guys are going to love it. So, 
Here we go. And I'm on the phone with Mr. Joe Queer from the infamous Queers. What's going on today, Joe? Not too much. Just uh, trying to stay warm here in Marietta, Georgia. Marietta, Georgia. I, I'm up in Indiana, and man, it's like five degrees right now. <laughs> Dude, I'm from New Hampshire, and I'll tell you what. You know, all my neighbors are complaining, and yes, it's cold, but it's still like 40 degrees and sunny, and, you know, it's still hoodie weather, so compared to like you know, five degrees in New Hampshire today or something. <laughs> I'll take this. Yeah. So you're in Marietta, Georgia. I've got to say that uh, when I was a young guy touring down in Marietta, there used to be a venue called Swayze's that was totally like this shrine to Patrick Swayze. Do you remember that at all? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 I know the people. I met them recently. Um, uh, the people, I think they just closed, but the, the original Swayze's I just found out last year was about a two minute walk from my house. Okay. So yeah. right off uh, Powder Springs. Yeah. And, um, we never played there by the time I started going, it was down in Bell's Ferry. Um, it was kind of dying out, but I, oh yeah, sure. I've, I've been there many times. Yeah. My, my wife and I were watching dirty dancing the other night and it just kind of came to me. I'm like, you know, we used to play this place in Marietta, Georgia, cause her mom is from Dublin, Georgia. So I was oh, like, yeah. we, we used to play this place in Marietta called Swayze's. And my wife was very intrigued by a venue that was dedicated to Patrick Swayze. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, we never, you know, we're always just down in the city. So we never played up there though. We did a birthday party for the guy and his wife that owned Swayze's and she set up a birthday party for him. It wasn't at Swayze's. They had closed. It was someplace up in Ackworth near here. So, which turned out to be like, we didn't know what to expect. It was like some American Legion place. And we don't usually do gigs like that, but, but we kind of know them, you know, as their fans. And so it turned out to be great. So anyway, that's my, <laughs> my best Swayze's uh, story. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, man, you and I have some mutual friends. I don't think we've ever met, but I know that you did some touring recently with my old band, the Ataris. Could oh, yeah. you, could you uh, tell me kind of how that relationship came about? Oh shit. I've known Chris since, um, I remember Chris Rowe coming to shows in Indiana, um, and Ohio and, you know, around that area and, um, giving me cassette tapes years and years ago. And that's how I know Chris. Yeah. And, um, I remember he's a little left-handed guitar player and he'd always give us tapes. And, um, and that's how I knew him from, from, I think he was there years ago and we played the first time in Indianapolis with Rancid and some little dumpy place. I can't remember the name. I remember the venue, but, um, I believe Chris was there. So that's how I knew him. That's how I know him. That, that's pretty cool. I just remember on tour, like I was always aware of the queers. I owned a lot of the records, but uh, we'd be on the road and you guys were a, a mainstay in the stereo when we were on the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. We, uh, I think we have a gig. We toured a lot with them lately and I think we have a gig coming up with them in March or something. So yeah, we're in touch. Uh, my, my bass player and our roadie guitar player, Ginger, they filled in on bass for Chris I think overseas. Oh, but anyway, so we're, yeah, we're like family with those guys, Dustin and the whole gang. So uh, it's pretty cool. That's awesome, man. Well, you know, I like to go pretty far back on this podcast. I don't know how many podcasts you've done. I'll only have you here for like maybe an hour or less, but I, I want to go back. I know that you guys formed in 1981. What kind of stuff were you listening to back then? Like what were some of the first bands that got you interested in thinking that maybe this was something you wanted to pursue? Oh, uh, back then, you know, we we're just out of high school and we're into the Ramones uh, Tulu, our original drummer, guitar player, bass player, buddy, me, Wimpy and Tulu starting the band. Um, he got the first he was going to um, oh, some school down in New York City. And anyway, he got the first Ramones album and he came back. He's like, you guys got to hear this. And he played his beat on the brat was the first Ramones song I ever heard. <laughs> That's awesome. We were, like sold. And so we. um that's how we got into it. But going in in high school, I was always into um, David Bowie's Ziggy Stars came out. I love that album. You know, I got into that. And then from there, the Velvet Underground and Lou Reed, Transformer, and then Mott the Hoople and T-Rex and so on and so forth. And um, so it was fun because I, I got to know Joey Ramone a little, you know, I mean, fairly well. We talk on the phone a lot, just like this. Yeah. And he was a little older than me, but, um, you know, we talked about T-Rex and, and he had never seen him, but Johnny saw him and, you know, he had the same influences. He was really into glam, 
But that's how I started. And then the Stooges. And then um, like when we heard the first Ramones album, it all kind of made sense from Ziggy Stardust and the Stooges and Velvet Underground and Lou Reed, Vicious and all that stuff. It just kind of segued into that very naturally. So um, that's where we were kind of listening to at 81 when we had started the band. Yeah, we still had all our old influences, but we had been into the Ramones. Meat Men, when that album came out, we loved that. Crippled Children Suck. Um, of course, Black Flag, TV Party. And finally, around 81, we'd been out of high school a few years. And we're just sitting around. It, we, we're, our life was exactly like the TV Party 7-inch, if you ever see the the picture. Yeah. That was us, sitting around in the clothes. We graduated. We were wearing a high school our senior year, drinking butt out of the can and watching Family Feud. <laughs> it was the Ramones. And so that's where we... Um, that's what we were listening to back then. And then we were like, you know, I always joke and say, oh, we listen to Meat Men and, you know, we figure we're better than this and we don't have a band. But I told Pesco, I said, we're joking. I mean, it, they were a big influence. And I saw Black Flag. The Meat Men album was out. And then I saw Black Flag. My brother lived in Manhattan Beach. So I went out there for a summer or something to work with him. And I saw Black Flag out there. And this was before Rollins. And I looked and I asked about five people in the audience. I'm like, who is this? You couldn't quite tell. The sound was horrible. Yeah. It was in Redondo Beach, I think. And these guys are like, it's fucking Black Flag, motherfucker. And um, it was so cool that the next day I called Wimpy and Tulu and I go, you, you I, I guess it was Wimpy, actually. And I said, we can start a band. I saw Black Flag and they're exactly like us. <laughs> this is before TV party, you know? Yeah. And, um, so when TV Party came out, we finally got off our ass and said, come on, man, let's start a band. And um, that's kind of when we started around there. Black Flag and the Ramones were our main influences. It's a, it's a big thing on this podcast. We talk about it a lot because Black Flag comes up. Now, if you had to choose your favorite singer of that band, which one would it be? Oh, I'd go back to Des Cadena. So would because, I. <laughs> um, yeah, because the thing was, I always say it was so I, I met him one time. Super nice guy. But um, to me, when I saw them, I thought they were going to be like a cross between the Ramones and pro wrestlers. Okay. And see them, and they had so much power, and they were just little skinny guys like me. Yeah. I expected a singer like Rollins that would you give him any shit, he's going to beat the crap out of you. But it was like these just skinny guys. And um, it was so empowering. It made such an impression on me that, um, I mean, I loved Rollins, too. But he's what I expected. Some tough guy was going to beat you up. And these guys had way more power when they were just little wimps. And that was Black Flag. I was like, oh, man, this is super cool, man. And um, so anyway, but that's, you know, I love Rollins, too. I thought he did a great job, you know. So, so uh, just kind of a tangent. I thought I wanted to get your take on this. I do this. Uh, I teach guitar for a living, and I'm doing this, uh, like, workshop with kids where we put bands together. And we're covering TV party, but we're changing all of the old school TV names to the new reality shows. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Yeah. It's kind of tough to get them all to rhyme like they did back then. But uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so you guys got going in 81. Was that your first attempt at a band like your, yourself? No, me and Wimpy, I met Wimpy years ago and um, we were in some cover band and then for about six months. I used to play trumpet in, in school. And so when I picked guitar up, I realized I was only going so far with trumpet and um, jumped on the guitar. And I was like, oh, this is way cooler. And then we're in a little cover band called Sky High. I remember that, man. We, we were the only ones that smoked pot and did coke. <laughs> and um, we were sitting in his car one day and I go, this sucks, man. We got to start a band. But yet it was good for me because I got to play Meet Wimpy and just play in a band. I hadn't played guitar in a band. So we segued into... Um, various little punk bands we we called ourselves the bugs the falling spikes uh we had these long almost like I mean, you ever see those nails that go in gutters they're yeah, like yeah they're aluminum well these ones weren't aluminum they were that size but they were made out of steel i don't know what they were used for they were actually huge nails and somehow don our bass player drilled a hole through them and we put them on chains and we would jump around and you know, on stage and they'd poke us in the eye. And if anybody laughed at us, which the whole crowd would laugh at us, we'd just go smoke a joint and say, they're all fags, you know, <laughs> like that. and, uh, 
that was one lineup and we had a couple of songs and then um and then we started the queers and, and kind of went with that whole thing. So, yeah, we played for a few years before that. Not not too, too long. But anyway, yeah, that's how we started. So, you know, one thing I've always been interested in is, you know, I've I've known of the band for a long time. Has the name ever caused you any issues over the years? Because, I mean, back in the day, it's kind of tongue in cheek, you know, and it's punk rock and it kind of makes sense. But when the the whole like Me Too movement and all the stuff that that's happening now, do you find some people nowadays maybe don't get the joke. Oh, oh God. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, before we'd have to worry about jocks showing up, uh, you know, and, and beating us up or getting attacked by, you know, even on tour with rancid. I mean, these guys did not like the name. We went on tour in Brazil with GBH. I mean, these guys, you didn't want to cross them. They just didn't get the joke. But now with this, you know, woke, you know, atmosphere, this woke culture where everybody, you know, they're all above us lowly peons who have a sense of humor. Um, you know, they attack us. Yeah, we had some kids protesting me at a show one time. It was pretty pathetic, man, three of them. And they're like, it was some, I can't remember what the one placard was. Um, we support queers, not the queers or something like that. Yeah. It's just like, you know, I come to the conclusion I'm not apologizing for anything. I got a sense of humor and I don't care. I mean, let's face it. You know, you go back all the great punk bands, the dead Kennedys, black flag circle jerks. They got their point across through humor. They yeah. were goofing on themselves. And now these people now are like, so, you know, enlightened that they just have no sense of humor. And what it comes down, if you peel back the layers of the onion, these people, they're just jealous that they don't have a life like you and me. You know what I mean? I yeah. get to travel around. I've got a million friends. It's what I wanted to do in high school when I played guitar. Jeez, I wish I could be in a band and travel around the world. I want to go to Italy. You know, and I did it in Japan. My wife's Japanese and blah, blah. And it's like, you know, really, they can't be honest with themselves. But, um, you know, we, we it's it's great. Music's great. I love it. It's what I wanted to do with my life. There's always, you know, there's always something to get out of bed for in the morning. Yeah. There's always something. New album, tour, this, that, guitars. It's great. How does it still feel as fresh to you now that like, you know, starting the band in 81, next year we're coming up on a pretty big milestone as far as having a band together, even though there's been lineup changes does it still feel fresh and kind of vibrant when you're writing songs and you're getting ready for that like next record? Yeah, we haven't made one in a few years, so um, it feels good to sit down and write. We've got so many albums out that we can't play half the songs we have now. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. As soon as we don't play Ursula finally has tits, half the crowd complains. So um, we try to switch it up as much as possible. But anyway, yeah, I'm pretty excited because it's a challenge to come up with a catchy album. I mean, I hear other stuff and I just want to put out a new album that's, excuse me, that's solid, you know. So it is kind of a challenge and, and it seems fresh. And, I've, and it'll be the first time we've recorded with um, with a lineup now, Ginger, Cheeto on bass and um, and Hoglog on drums. So uh, we're really tight. We We've toured for three or four years with this unit, so I'm really excited. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I still get excited about it. So explain maybe the writing process. Like, are you sitting around with an acoustic guitar? I mean, does there need to be some certain kind of ambiance when you sit down to write, or is it just stuff hits you all the time? No, usually what I do is I write down song titles. I've got like three pages of song titles here someplace, and – um I kind of envision on the back of the album, the, the album, the song titles. And I, I like that makes the impact. Now, if I could look at it, like when I first saw Booga Da Booga Da by Screeching Weasel years and years ago, me and B-Face, I saw I Hate Led Zeppelin. I said, I've never heard this band B-Face and I love them. Yeah. And seriously. And so I always envision like the song titles and we have a bunch of cool song titles and we'll have a little chorus. We'll sing in the van or something and we'll tape it. And um, usually it starts with the song titles and um, and then I just sit down and I'll fool around on my guitar. I plug in out in the studio and I just play around and try to come up with the chorus first. And then I kind of back into it. and I get a bridge. I work backwards kind of. But I always figure if we got a good catchy chorus, we're good to go and we can write something there. But that's how it starts. Really, we just will come up with song titles and I write them down and save them. And that's how I start. 
So saying that, you know, you played in the school band, you did trumpet and whatnot. Are you versed at all in like music theory for the guitar or are you just kind of just hunting around finding the notes that you think work? Like what is your stance on the whole theory thing? I mean, I don't read music for guitar, but I can read music from the trumpet days. I played for 14 years. I was first trumpet. So um, it was easy to pick up. Yeah. Because I had been in the band and dance band and jazz band. And so it was a really great experience. I loved it, but I realized I couldn't play the staccato notes. And I go, dude, I am only going so far with the trumpet. It sucked because I loved it. But um, so picking up the guitar, no, I don't like read music with the guitar. But I mean, I know all the chords and scales and all that stuff. So I just, you know, I just fool around and play on, on the guitar. And usually I don't practice. I I just work on songs. Are are you doing like demos with any kind of like garage band or anything and showing the other guys or do you guys all get together and kind of pound it out together? Both. I've got, a, I'm in my studio with Pro Tools. So I just sit here with my mic, my SM7 actually. <laughs> and, um, and I've got my guitar running through a little hot tone five watt amp and, um, and I'll put them down. But then sometimes, a lot of times our best songs we'll be together just laughing about shit and we'll be like, all right, let's finish this song. We'll write it in five minutes. Yeah. Uh, we did that with born to do dishes. We did it with Ursula and noodle brain wrote that one morning together. Um, so with this lineup, um, uh, we've got a song called Cheeto and a speedo eating a burrito, kind of a homage sort of like to the Dickies cause we've toured with them a lot and we love them. Um, that one's almost half done when we just were singing it in the van. So we'll, we'll get together and finish that one together. So, um, it, it varies, I guess, you know, some stuff I have here down, I don't know. I kind of like at this point getting the involvement with the other guys. I hate going in with a song and saying it goes like this. Yeah. I want to throw it at them. And invariably, someone's like, oh, oh, dude, I hear this. What about this? And they'll hum something and we'll switch. So I keep kind of keep it free and easy, whereas before we'd have everything mapped out. But we did write most stuff in the early days together. OK. Rehearsal. Yeah. So. So I was reading that, you know, you guys formed in 81, like we were talking about, but then actually broke up in 84 and then reformed in 86 with a new lineup with you and some other guys. What what kind of led to the a breakup and then the initial reforming two years later? Well, Tulu left and um, we loved it. We loved it for a couple of years, but he went back to school in New York and um, we hadn't really thought about being a band forever. But at the point, Wimpy, I kind of moved on. I realized I was writing some songs that Wimpy couldn't sing them. He's great on Kicked Out of the Weed Blows and This Place Sucks and that sort of stuff. But I wanted to get into more melodic stuff. I went down to Boston. We had a bass player, Kevin Kesey, who was from Portsmouth, the new Tulu and Wimpy. So I met Kevin and then met J.J. Rouser from DMZ. They were on Sire Records, great garage band, Mono Man, uh, The Liars, that he was in with that garage stuff. So um, we wanted to get a singer. And then finally, we couldn't find a singer. And J.J. was like, why don't you just sing? And so that's why I started. But I wanted to do more melodic stuff. So we had the Wimpy stuff was great. And then I wanted to segue into more melodic stuff and um, that Wimpy, you know, couldn't sing really or wouldn't. And um, couldn't, I should say. He was never against it, but it was just not <laughs> his thing, you know. Yeah. And so I segued into that. And then I bought a restaurant, didn't play from 89 to 90. And I was working in my restaurant. And then we met B-Face. And Hugh and I wanted to get the band together and B-Face kind of learned bass. And um, then we went into that lineup, and, which ran its course. It's like, you know, was, I'm, yeah, do you get into ELO? You ever know the I mean, history? Yeah, I'm a casual listener. Yeah, I like them, though. Yeah. And so, you know, I was ta reading some interviews with the old Mike de, de Albuquerque, the old bass player, and he was saying how the band went through various phases with different members. And that's how it's been with the queers. You know, we went up to Don't Back Down with Hugh and B-Face. Hugh got sick. I went to rehab, B-Face and I, and we were fighting like cats and dogs. It was horrible. We should have been the happiest band in the world. We had a three-album deal on the table from Epitaph. Wow. Yes. And they didn't want to go, and they wanted to stay on lookout, but I knew we had hit our stride with with that. And um, But whatever, you know, they just... But we had gotten to the point, I think, it wasn't even going to... It was because it was my idea they didn't want to go to Epitaph, you know? It was ridiculous, so... 
at that point, we got Chris Fields from John Cougar and the Dwarves on bass. And we really turned a corner musically and really stepped it up from there, which is no knock on B-Face and Hugh. But uh, we really, I always give Chris credit because we just turned a corner and just started sounding better. So that was a whole other thing, punk rock confidential era and um, pleasant screams and, and, you know, monkey brain. And we went, really turned the corner at that point. And then, um, you know, anyway, um, so it's gone, the band's gone through different phases, but I love playing with different people. Some people would give me shit, but look at that lineup for ELO or Jethro Tull or any of these bands. They've had a million guys. You know, you look at our Wikipedia page, it's like anybody who's like been a roadie of ours is listed as a member. You know, it's like these guys weren't members, but if that's their claim to fame, fine. A lot of them did one tour or something, you know, like Chris with the Atari. Well, no, you know? that, that's the thing. Like I'm formerly of the Ataris, but so are 190,000 other people. <laughs> Right. And as Chris will tell you, it's hard to keep a lineup together. You know, we don't yeah. like we're not rich off this stuff. We're not at that level. So, um, you know, it. so but um, a lot of times with me, the guys. Oh, I've had Dave Salsa, man, Philip Hill from Teen Idols. Oh, I know I've Phil. Had, Phil's great, man. Yeah. Great guys. But, you know, they get married. They have kids. Both those guys did. Um, I still talk to Philip all the time. Um, you know, Lurch nobody from the nobodies he he played with dangerous dave and then dave you know they just got burned out on the road you understand yeah. you know it's not for everybody um so i mean uh, i'd still be touring if i didn't have two kids and right a house yeah. and everything that's why exactly. I, do the, I do the podcast because i miss kind of talking right. to musicians and knowing what it's like on the road like I, I really miss it so that's why i started this yeah yeah, I understand. And it's like we all get older. And so, you know, I was able to do it. My wife and I don't have kids, you know, yeah. so um, she's cool. She we've been able to do it. And, and a lot of guys can't. But I'm kind of a lifer. You know, it's like if I'm alive, I'm playing music, you know. Yeah. So um, I've been lucky to be able to do it and, and have my house paid for and, you know, make a living. And my guys make you know, we, we do well with the queers. So, um, yeah, people just evolve, but everybody seems to play, bring something to the table. So everybody will play. Yeah. The songs are recorded and all that stuff, but you know, the enthusiasm of the guys now can't be beat Hoglog on drums, Cheeto on bass, ginger on guitar. And we're having a ball. We've really stepped it up to this is the best we've ever played. And, um, so yeah, with different guys, it, you miss them, but um, I miss more of the behind the scenes camaraderie with B face or or Hugh, of course, he passed away. But um, Philip, you know, I'm still in touch with the guys. Lurch, I just texted him today. Dave, we talk, you know, we're all still in touch. They're some of my best friends. So, um, you know, anyway, that's how we've evolved. But, uh, you know, it keeps everything fresh for me, too, yeah. you know. So. so, you were talking about uh, when the one guy joined and things kind of you know, solidified and you thought that it was like the catalyst for, you know, getting better or sounding better. I have a, a, a listener question, Dave from Oklahoma. He said, what was the genesis of the change in sound from the original gritty style of early queers music to the more popular sound the band incorporated since the nineties? Oh, I was always into the bubblegum stuff. And so, um, with Gigi Allen, actually, he's another New Hampshire boy that we knew back in the day. Awesome. Um, I I love the Black Flaggy stuff, but I was writing songs like Goodbye California, Deborah Jean, Daydreaming, um, uh, stuff like that. And Wimpy couldn't sing it. So it was just songs I had. And I just realized I kind of I knew we had a ceiling on that the band as it was with wimpy singing in that style. And so that's all it was. I was just writing more poppy stuff. And, um, we just started doing that. And then when we got on lookout, we had Deborah Jean daydreaming and, and, and all our music that we had been doing before I even heard of lookout just fit on the label. And so that was it. No, nothing really thought out. It just happened that way. So one thing I wanted to ask you about lookout, I mean, I know you guys work with at the beginning, shaken street records, and you did a lot of stuff with Lookout, and then you did a couple things with Hopeless. But in the years since then, and if you listen to stuff on Spotify, everything has been re-released on Asian Man. Was was it a hard kind of thing to do to get masters back, or did Asian Man buy everything? Could, could you walk me through that a little bit? Oh, no, no, no. Lookout, they were going down the tube, so I talked to Chris. 
which was sad. But anyway, um, he just signed over the rights to all our albums for that stuff. And then Hopeless, um, they own the rights to those albums. So that's why we redid Beyond the Valley and Punk Rock Confidential. We kind of did on both those albums a live in the studio. Um, I didn't want to recreate you know, note by note, those recordings. So we did a kind of live in the studio uh, version of those just because Hopeless owns them. And then, um, you know, yeah, Asia Man, we've got like a subsidiary called All Star Records. We're putting our new album out, but it's it's Mike and Asia Man. So that's what happened there. It was no big, Chris was, you know, I'm friends with Larry and Chris and all that stuff. So it was no big deal. They gave me an official thing that I probably lost, but it was all kind of handshake word of mouth. So, I mean, that's how Mike Park is too. I love it. He's like, Hey man, I don't do contracts. If bands don't want to work with me, that's fine. They can go. He actually will help bands on his label, try to get on bigger labels. That's how Mike is. He's into the bands, you know? So, um, it's great. Uh, So that's how he operates. So it really was natural to go from like a, a lookout thing to, to, um, Asian man. So that's what happened there. And I don't think I don't think many of my listeners, I mean, the musicians probably know, but the reason that you guys kind of did those revisited versions of those records is because if a label owns the masters, then you're not allowed to put them out, but you own the songs, correct? Yes, yeah, exactly. So we got some crap because I think people, you know, like the original, and I do too, but we wanted to have something. Hopeless took all the stuff off YouTube and we're like, oh, screw you. Let's get something up there. And, um, you know, so we, we did, we don't get paid from hopeless anyway. They still say to this day, I owe them 4,000. It's kind of laughable. I think I owe them $4,000, wow. <laughs> a $6,000 advance. I got 21 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could pay that off with the royalties. I'm pretty sure they've recouped. I think that's probably bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, uh, anyway, I just, I had to let that one go. Um, Cause it, you know, you can't let that stuff eat you up. It's just like, it, it sucks, but whatever. So I, you were talking about uh Mike over at Asian man. I always thought it was funny on that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's that fat wreck documentary. And uh, for the longest time, Mike, uh, Mike, fat Mike had people sending demos to the Asian man address attention, Mike. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so like Mike Park for the last 20 years keeps getting like demos in the mail that were meant for fat records. I was just thought that was kind of funny, but oh, I never heard that one. That's a wise guy thing to do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I never heard that. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I'm not a fat records is a great label, you know, so was Epitaph, but I'm not really into the fat rec sound type, you know what I mean? The fast drumming and all that stuff, it drives me crazy, but um. No denying, man. They've, I th- always thought that me first and the gimme gimme's was a funny idea. I wish I, I was jealous. I wish I thought that that was a great idea. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I never heard that. I make sure, though, if I see a band that I really like, Mike, Hughes, he's doing his own thing. And the, that label's kind of segued off into a different type of thing than we do. But um, if I hear a good band, I always make sure to they write on the thing, attention, Mike, uh, put my name on it. And I alert Mike. Otherwise he still gets a million things. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. Uh, could you kind of, I was very interested. I want to hear about, uh, one of my favorite Ramones records, of course, rocket to Russia. You guys kind of did like a queers reimagining or just a re-recording of that record. How did that all come about? At the time, it seems funny now, but um, Weasel had done, what did they do, Leave Home or something? I can't remember what they did. The first album, I guess they did. Um, at the time, we wanted to record it because we needed more stuff to sell on the road. <laughs> yeah. So that was it. Honest to God, I thought it was a dumb idea. We had a pretty fun time because we were friends with Ben and it was fun and he produced it. We had a fun time, but we didn't put a lot of thought into it. We went to his house over in Schiller Park and um and we uh on ruby street and we just went over it in his in his um living room we spent a day or two just going over the stuff and then jumped in a studio i can't even remember where we recorded it and um and did it really quick Uh, my thing was i thought it was kind of dumb because i was just if i cover a song i want to see if i can maybe do it better or we can do something different or we can try something but i just thought the ramones 
were so perfect on Rocket to Russia that was there was nowhere we could go with it except to just do it the same. So um, I, I wasn't really into the Ramones cover album thing that much. Um, I didn't think we added much to it. However, it was a fun project. I mean, it was fond memories, but I thought the whole thing was stupid. Now, uh, you know, you saying that you were friends with Joey and whatnot, did he hear it? Did you get the stamp of approval from the guys? I don't know if I ever actually talked to him about it. I think I was sort of embarrassed that we did it. Um, I don't know. I don't think I ever talked to him about it. He was, he got into us. We knew him years ago through our first bass player when I went to Boston, Kevin Kesey. He was like some WBCN, the big radio station guy. He's one of these guys that would always, I'm sure we all have friends like that, they would always get to meet the famous people. He'd met Joan Jett. He met the, the Bangles. He met, you know, this chick and that band and knew Joey. And when Dee Dee Ramone flew up for an interview on WBCN, Kevin picked him up. He was well, that type of guy. So um, we knew, we opened up for the Ramones back in 86 when Richie was drumming for him at the Agora Ballroom in Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> Dude, we were horrible. <laughs> We, we had never played it. It was about 3,000, 4,000 people. We had never played in front of 400. Never. It was usually, we were lucky. We'd call it a good crowd if we got 40. Yeah. So um, I was shaking like a dog passing a peach pit, and uh, we sucked. Oh, we sucked. We didn't know how to play in front of a big city. You know, we played every song we knew and some we didn't. I mean, when we got into Louie Louie for the third time, they sent a roadie out and said, get these fuckers off stage or they'll be here all night. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's when Joey told me a good bit of information. He took me back. He knew we didn't know shit from ass from a hole in the ground. And he said, dude, when you open up for bands, always play your best 22 and a half minutes and get off stage. He said, the crowd likes it. The, the sound guys like it. You know, I never forgot that. And he goes, he goes, most bands only have one good song anyway. So, you know, after 20 minutes, you've said your thing. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, we met... Um, we, we so Joey got in. So we knew Joey quite, you know, from way back then. And um, one time we got his address and I sent him a tape of four songs from Grow Up. It was Love, 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 Goodbye, California, I'll Be True to You, and I Don't Want to Get Involved with You. And I'll never forget this one. I went to the University of New Hampshire with my friend Tammy and we bullshitted our way backstage at a Ramon show, I mean, maybe a month after I'd sent the tape. So I said I was. <laughs> I said I was Richard Hell's cousin, and so they immediately took me back. These college, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I walked backstage, and Monty goes, "He's not Richard Hell's cousin." And um, they were playing ping pong, and I said, "Joey, it's Joe from the Queers." He's like, "Oh, Monty, it's cool." But he came right up to me. I'll never forget it. I get goosebumps thinking about it now. And Joey said, "Oh, Joe, I love Goodbye California and Love, Love, Love." And I mean, I just said I was in the queers. I didn't say, what do you think of love, love, love? Good. He knew the songs and we talked for about 15 minutes before they went on stage. And I'll tell you what it, oh my God, did that mean a lot to me that Joey listened to the songs. He even told me he wanted to cover love, love, love. Wow. And, um, yeah. And um, so I'll never forget that. But anyway, we segue through and then he would come to shows now and then in New York City and he saw us on Lookout and, and was always psyched. But when we did Don't Back Down, that's when I became closer friends with him because he told me he liked the fact that we did the Ramones thing with the Beach Boys vocals, which he said he always wanted to do. He said the Ramones, you know, were one side and all that, no real back vocals. And he said, I always wanted to do more back vocals. And so that's when we kind of really became better friends. We talked mainly on the phone and stuff, but it was really made me good because he said, I really thought there was some territory there that you guys are mining between the Ramones and the Beach Boys and the, the Turtles and all that great stuff with the back vocals that I really love to do. So so that was where we we really became friends there. So when you guys are playing live now, do you guys do many covers? It depends, really. Um, no, we played with Weasel in Chicago, and so we, we did a new set over there. Um, did we do any covers? Usually we'll do like a Ramon song or um, sometimes a weasel. Uh, it depends. We kind we don't use a set list. So we'll, I tell the guys ahead of time, ahead of tour, like hey, be ready for this song if I yell it out or 
Cheeto go into Chewy Chewy or so, you know, so we kind of wing it. So it, it changes. It, kind of feed off the crowd, you know, so. So I guess the, the other guys in the band, since you have such a extensive catalog, they have to be ready for kind of anything, right? Yeah, I'll warn them ahead. And I said, hey, if the crowd's into it, watch out. I'll go, I'll give you the thumbs up after this song and we'll go into Mirage or um, they're kind of ready for it. It looks like we're like right on starting and stopping on a dime, turning on a dime. But um, we kind of know ahead of time. I'll yell out a song or I start on guitar or, you know, we have it sort of planned out, but yeah, they're ready. I could yell out Mirage or I could yell out, I want to be happy or I could yell out Chewy Chewy and they'll, they'll go into it. So yeah, it's, it's fun because we feed off the, the, the audience, you know, so many times I've seen bands and they, they play great, but they don't go with a the flood. They're not feeding off the energy of the crowd. We let the crowd tell us where to go. They want to hear more poppy stuff. We'll do that. They want to hear harder stuff. We'll do that. Um, so many times the bands have a set amount of songs and they just stick with it, you know, and it's like, no, I'll drop and go off into this other direction with girl about town from monkey brain or Duke on a you know, we don't know. It keeps it fresh. We stay on our toes and, um, you know, we'll do Booberell off Grow Up. We never know. You know, it's it's uh, Mirage is a song you can't put it in the set. It'll suck nine times out of ten, but that tenth time will be fucking gold. You know, and so that's how we look at a lot. Of, Janelle, Janelle's another song off Don't Back Down. You can't put it in the set, but if it you feel the crowd, you go into it. It's like gold. So that's how we approach it. Well, that that kind of leads me into my my next listener question. Brian from California said, "Would you ever consider doing a tour and just playing all the poppy love songs?" Probably not. I mean, I was uh, the Dummy Room guys did the top queers rated the queers albums or something, and um, they're like, "Oh, the people would come out of the woodwork for a pop set." The problem is that. If you play that mid-tempo slow stuff, you can't do a night, you can't do an evening of it. It's boring as hell. It's like going to a James Taylor concert or something or Billy Joel or something. It's like, yes, I love Voodoo Doll and yes, I love I'll Be True to You and I enjoy being a boy and Brian Wilson and I think she's, you know, but if you do a back-to-back of that from your boy, it's like, it just doesn't work live in my estimation. So, um you know, we could switch it up, certainly, and I think that's as close as we'll get to doing it. We did it in Chicago with Weasel. We came out and did, of course, a lot of those people had seen us many times because we tour a lot. So we did Steak Bomb and Drop the Attitude. We did Mrs. Brown, You've Got an Ugly Daughter, which is a great song. We, uh, Janelle, Janelle, Don't Back Down. We switched around. Surf Goddess, we did that one. It was fun. So if we do a set like that, yeah, sure, we can fit in a lot more, but it has to kind of segue. I'd love to do it. I love the poppy stuff, and I'd love to do a set, but it's too boring. <laughs> okay. You know? Well, thanks, Brian, for your question. Um, I was going to ask you, this 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 show's kind of about touring. That's kind of how it got started. I know that you guys have been kind of everywhere, and you were talking earlier about how, you know, your life is good. You get to go play your guitar in Italy and all these places you want to go. Have there been any countries that have stood out to you that are like your favorites to go back to? Oh, we love Italy, Brazil, though we haven't been down there in a little while. Um, Japan. I don't know. I'll be honest with you, man. I am so happy to go. Hey, we showed up in Moscow. We only had two days off. They asked us to go up there. So we had two days after Finland, which was a Sunday and a Monday that we could go play Russia. And Baggy, the promoter up there, said, dude, come on up. That's fine. Sunday and Monday. So we did Moscow and St. Pete. This is after going to Finland for the first time. And both shows were like packed, Helsinki and Tampara. And we're like, Tampara? I don't even know where I am. <laughs> yeah. Packed. And... um we went up there, and I'll tell you what, I would have paid, we made money, but I would have paid to go to Moscow and play that. It was a snowy night. We'd been up, flew in from Tampara and just through, through um, Latvia or someplace over there. And, um, and uh, you know, the kids were so appreciative that we showed up, man. You know, they're like, Joe, queer. Can I take pictures? They knew all the lyrics, you know, and I'm going, here I am, a bum from New Northampton, New Hampshire. And these guys, these kids were so appreciative of the fact the queers were there, you know. 
Dude, I told the guys afterwards, I said, dude, I would pay to come up and do this. Went to St. Pete. Wasn't as many kids, but it was still packed, and they were so into it. Just rabid fans that, um, you know, it's it's. I hate to say, oh, I like Italy better than Moscow, you know. I mean, it was just so exciting to go there. Italy, we get great crowds. Spain, we do great there. Germany, it's, on any given night, it could be anywhere. Really, our last two Euro tours have been... I don't know. We really didn't have any off nights. We had a bad show in Savona, Italy or something, but, or, or Pescara, I guess, you know, someplace even I knew we shouldn't have played on a Monday night, but whatever. There were still those 25 kids there that were just so excited to see us. So, you know, I just like, I like traveling. So I, I hate to say one place over the other, Chicago, San Francisco, you know what I mean? Dallas, it's, you never know. <laughs> so I, I just, we're lucky that we get, Good crowd, but I don't look at it like with the queers. People say, "Oh, do you wish you got as big as Green Day?" And I'm like, "Hey, man, when I was back in high school, this is all I ever wanted to do. I didn't want to, you know. Success isn't isn't going on, you know, playing in front of thirty thousand people, which I've done in Brazil. But it's like, you know, some. I'll tell you what. Uh, this kid came up to me, a guy, probably early forties. This was last year, and. Um, comes up to me he's like hey joe i want to uh, can i talk to you and i said yeah sure and he goes listen my buddy my my best friend whatever his name was wanted me to come up and say you saved his life and i go i saved his life who was this and he goes dude years ago back in the 90s when we all grew you know in the scene he said he was suicidal and he never told me back then but he wrote to like four or five bands and he said he was ready to kill himself and nobody wrote back to him, but you wrote like a four page letter. Now, I was a fuck up. But when someone said there was suicide, you know, I gave him my phone number. Apparently, the guy told me he still has the letter, apparently. And the guy said he was ready to kill himself. He had the plan where he was going out in the woods and he had the gun and all that stuff. But he got your letter in the mail and he read that thing. And he said that he wanted me to tell you he's got three kids now. He's married. He's got a great job. And he's my best friend. The guy's got like tears in his eyes telling me. And he goes. But he got that letter and you saved his life. And I said, you know, I don't care about being as big, big as Green Day. I saved some fucking dude's life. And that's what music's about. You know, have you ever read that book by Chris? I think his name's Chris Berger. Um, he was an engineer at the record plant in New York City. Glenn Berger. Glenn Berger. I think I know what you're talking about. I don't think I've read well, it, though. I know it the might book. be called Life of a Tape Off. And I bought it thinking I'd find out what microphone Bob Dylan sang through in 71 or something, but no, it was all behind the scenes, kind of like what you're doing. You know, that's the interesting stuff. It's not the shit on stage yeah. playing in front of people. It's all behind the scenes. And, um, he was telling the story where he, he got to work. He was a guy pushing tapes from studio to studio down the streets in New York in the summer to where he was like a producer guy. And then he wanted to go, you know, find more about music. He was kind of finding his way through, um, you know, music. He wasn't sure where he wanted to take it. So he went up to like Berkeley or something like this. And this guy he was talking to this guy about music, a uh, teacher up there, professor. And the guy took him aside and he said his best performance ever, something like this, I'm paraphrasing, but this professor said he played in a nursing home sax or clarinet or something for the people. And then he said, why is this other guy off there by himself? And they said, oh, he's deaf and he can't understand. Uh, you know, he can't hear. So the guy went over and played his sax or clarinet for this deaf guy. And the guy started crying and thanked him so much. And he said, that's what music is about. You know what I mean? It's about playing for the deaf guy. It's about, you know, writing to it. You know, that's the power of music. It's not getting as big as Green Day. You know, yeah. I don't, you yeah. know what I mean? And so, I mean, you as an aside, I almost killed myself with the with the money I had. So if I had gone on Epitaph or gotten any bigger, I wouldn't even be here. I probably would have killed myself if I had more money. And I had a lot of money and I blew up. You know what I'm saying? So I look at it like that. So um, anyway, yeah, you never know with music. So it, it's such a joy to play. And these kids in Moscow and went up there. I don't they don't have any money. You know what I mean? And, and so I don't know what we we made. But. It wasn't about the money, man. You know, I got friends all around the world. You know, I can go to Boise. I can go to Japan. I can go to Grasso, Austria. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, I got friends there. And so that's what music has brought me, you know, and, and friendships and all that stuff. So 
it, it's pretty cool, you know. Well, I tell you what, man, I think that's probably a pretty good way to cap this interview off. Or actually, chat, I feel like music has brought you and I together. Now we can be friends, man. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great thing. You do music and, and uh, I love the fact, you know, you got your thing going on, but you're keeping your foot in the, in the, the water, you know, you're, and, and, um, and that's the whole scene. It's not just writing songs and being in a band. I love it, but it's, it's a job that we do where we make friends. Every time I go on tour, I make new friends. Yeah. Good friends. You know what I mean? That's why I got my studio. I mean, it's it's really a blessing. So the older I get, the more I find value, thank God, in in the friendships and that stuff. And it has nothing to do with how much, you know, really the good times in music. Same for you. You don't remember how much money you made. It had nothing to do no. with money. It's about the the fun times and it's all behind the scenes. It's not like, oh, dude, yes, we all have stories like some, you know, big bosom girl took her shirt off and she stayed, you know what I mean? Yes, but it's not about that. It's just like all behind the scenes and the traveling and the touring and all that good stuff. So yeah, I really like the whole aspect of the uh, show. I really like it. So thank you for asking me to do it. Well, yeah, like all the, all the stories that I tell, you know, my students or my family members, my wife, whatever, they're all the stories of when we were sleeping on floors. It's not being on a bus, right. you know, it had nothing to do. Exactly. As a matter of fact, we had more fun in the band when we had no money. When money started coming in with Lookout, then yeah, that's when things got messed up. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's great. Get that Glenn Berger book. I. It's got nothing. It's not like oh, you know, we did it. It was all the behind the scenes thing. So I bet you love it. And he's now the guy's a psychiatrist or something. Wow. Uh, West. It's really an interesting story. So I, yeah, I, I, you'd like it. Get that. But Glenn Berger. I will definitely check it out, man. Well, hey, uh, what do you guys have coming up in the future? I know you said you were writing. Do you have any dates booked or anything? We, um, for a tour, we're doing some shows in March. I think we're doing five shows. One's with the Dolly Rots, one's with the Ataris. I don't know. It's kind of up to Chicago and back. And then we go over to Europe around mid-April till May. And then so right now we're just kind of banging out songs together and we're going to record, I hope, in late February, early March here at my studio. So, um, yeah, that's about it. So Cool, man. Well, do you want to plug any social media or anything so that people can check it out? I mean, we've got our Facebook page and Instagram. I don't deal with it. Cheeto does. Okay. I try to stay off that stuff. So um, I don't really have anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if there's any starving bands out there and need a place to stay and they are uh, recording, they don't have any money, hit me up. I've got a studio here and, and I love to work with young bands and bands that don't have money. I remember it so well, not being able to record. So I've got my house paid for. I've got a big studio. I'm like, hey, man, I always tell bands, if you're broke, you get your ass down here. I'll record you. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to put all the info in the show notes so people can check you out. Joe, I just want to say thank you so much for come on, coming on today. I've been a big fan of the queers ever since, I'm going to say, probably the beginning of high school. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, seriously, thanks for asking me, Chris. It's been fun. Yeah, and uh, when you guys have that new record come out, come on back and we'll talk about it, okay? Absolutely. I'll be in touch. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Take care. So there it was my conversation with Joe from the queers. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did having the conversation with Joe. It was an honor for me. I've been listening to the queers for a long time. I mean, since freshman year in high school or something like that, it's crazy. And uh, yeah, his publicist reached out and we made it happen. And it was a lot of fun. And I can't wait to have Joe back in the future when they drop some new queer stuff. So shout out to Joe and all the guys in the queers. Uh, love you guys. And it was an honor having you on the program. So that's it for today's program, guys. That's the episode. Next week on the show, it's a big one for me. It's a band I've been listening to for a long time as well. Uh, Josh from The Beautiful Mistake graces me with his presence. The Beautiful Mistake is such a good band, and they've been away forever, man. I don't think they've done anything for like a decade, and uh, or maybe maybe less than a decade, but close to a decade, maybe like eight years. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, The Beautiful Mistake is back. They have like a five-song EP that's dropping soon. They did it with Bo from uh, Seosin. He, Bo Burchell, he does all kinds of cool production stuff, and 
man, I've heard the entire EP and you cannot beat it. It is awesome. They haven't missed a step. They've been gone for a while, but the, it's it's wonderful. Uh, they're playing the the new like the reboot of Furnace Fest coming up this year down in Alabama, my old stomping grounds. I'm going to try to make it down there for Furnace Fest and try to do some interviews, try to maybe kick out a bunch of episodes down there. So, uh, yeah, make sure that you guys pre-save and everything, the new EP and all the singles from The Beautiful Mistake. Just check out all the streaming platforms and search for The Beautiful Mistake. But Josh will be on the program next week, so come back for that. And I have been booking some crazy guests. To say the least, man, there's a couple guys that uh, I got hooked up through a mutual friend. And, you know, they do the whole introduction thing over text message. And then I'm at the grocery store buying milk and I'm getting text messages back and forth from guys that I can't believe even it blows my mind and and you're going to, you're going to love it. I can't say anything yet because the dates haven't actually been ironed out for the podcast, but some great guests coming up, the guests that I'm a fanboy of. So if you enjoy me sounding like I'm stupid, (laughs) Because there's been a lot of those episodes, you know, i.e. the Lars Fredrickson episode and the Matt Pinfield episode and uh, Chris from Propagandi. Go back and listen to those and see how much of a fanboy I am. But needless to say, when these new guests sign up and we figure out the dates, I'm going to have to calm myself down to do some of these interviews and not sound like a 12 year old girl going to a No Direction concert. So, uh, no Direction. See? New Direction. What's their name? Is that their name? New Direction? One Direction. That should tell you right there. I'm I'm not a One Direction fan. However, Harry Styles' new record is pretty killer. I've got a student. Uh, shout out to B. She loves, she loves Henry Styles, and she's let me hear some of the new stuff. And I got to say, I wouldn't have listened on my own, but I really enjoy it. So, uh, yeah. One Direction. Who knew, man? Maybe maybe they're all just really really talented. I'm just I just slept on One Direction. I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to stop I'm going to stop jabbering about all this stuff. But uh one more thing, uh if you guys need any help with your podcast or your band needs something mixed or mastered or whatever you need along those lines, I've started this new little business, kind of a nod to my network, Jabberjaw. It's called Motormouth Digital. So uh, you can just hit me up and um, we can talk about it. I have really, really affordable rates for anything that you need as far as podcast editing or mixing or mastering or music mixing or mastering or whatever you need. Let me know and we will take care of it. And uh, yeah, you can just hit me up at the TOTOT podcast at gmail.com or motormouth digital at gmail.com. Okay, guys, I love you, and uh, make sure you come back, subscribe, do everything so you don't miss any of these amazing guests that are coming up. Next week, Josh from The Beautiful Mistake will be here, but until then, I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite songs from The Queers. It is entitled, See You Later, Fuckface, and uh, it's a great song, and you guys are going to love it. So I will catch you guys on the flip side. As always, this is Chris. Peace.
20. And they see too. That's what time? Our turn. <laughs> This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network.